Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Sahitya Academy and IP University for having invited me to this very important symposium on uh, literature, culture and ecology. Today, my topic of discussion will be folklore research, reading methodologies. Thank you, Professor Manpreet and Malashri Ma'am for the invite. Professor Vivek, Professor Sachi Mohanty, uh, Krishna Kimbaune Ji, Jyoti Krishnan Ji, uh, Abhay Ji, uh, Dr. Vipin, uh, Ashish De, and uh, the other dignitaries on the days, uh, teachers and students of this university of IP University. Uh, today I will look at uh, Indian mythology and folklore uh, and uh, the cultural ecology thereof. Uh, I would talk about uh, folklore and deep ecology, uh, the interplay. Uh, in the morning, the Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor uh, Mahesh Verma, he has talked about social change. Uh, uh, in a nimble way through literature. Uh, probably my focus would be on that, uh, how folklore research can create a slow and steady uh, progress, growth uh, in our you know, research of cultural ecology. Uh, let me talk about uh, sustainable coexistence uh, of uh, human beings with uh, the natural world. Uh, Professor Sachi Mohanty talked about paganism and pantheism of William Wordsworth. I would carry it forward uh, to uh, the pantheism in folk literature. And like uh, Malashri Lal, Madam talked about uh, uh, the importance of mythology and folklore today. Uh, I would carry that idea forward and talk about the importance of uh, uh, mythology and folklore in Indian classrooms, especially in English disciplines. Uh, my research points will be uh, folklore as healing and redemption through its ecological and cerebral consciousness and uh, folklore as uh, revisionistic history and uh, an organic view of life through folklore and canon formation, folklore research as a new canon. Uh, my point of interest would be not just reading or writing folklore, but uh, doing folklore. And uh, Anthropocene, which is the study of human beings, and Anthropomorphism, which is the study of animals. Uh, in folklore as environmental study, this would be one of my important points of discussion. Uh, then Indian thinking from Sanskrit, Persian and native traditions is another important uh, point of discussion today. Feminist, queer and disability approaches to folklore is one more point of research. Uh, I would give examples from the Jataka tales and the Panchatantra tales vis-à-vis uh, -vis animal studies. Uh, Bharata Varsha and Faris, which are India and Iran, uh, how in the folklore of both these regions, uh, the element of deep ecology is found uh, in the research related to folklore is uh, another important point for me today. Uh, and to prove my discussion on ecology and folklore, uh, please allow me to take the case study of the Lakshmi Purana uh, by Balaram Das, Odia writer of the 15th century. While doing so, uh, I will be talking about uh, Jagannath cult uh, and ecology. And uh, uh, towards the end of my uh, discussion, I would talk about the theoretical, to theoretical tools of uh, reading folklore. Uh, well, um, in this lecture, I will make an attempt to understand folklore as an epistemological system and its system of knowing literature, culture and ecology. Epistemology is the philosophical study of nature, origin and limits of human knowledge. 
and uh, as you know the term uh, epistem it has been uh, epistemology it has been derived from the greek term episteme which means knowledge and logos which means reason or study uh this is distinguished from authoritarian knowledge which depends on the information that has been obtained from research or books or experts and uh, folklore research is also differentiated from logical knowledge which is the creation of a new knowledge through the application of reasoning and logic uh, folklore looks at reality and it processes it with logic uh reasoning but uh, the appeal of folklore is far better and different uh, due to its imaginative construction folklore is imaginative it's creative isn't it and uh, it is seen that written and oral forms the intuitive and the logical forms of folklore the merge on uh, in an increasingly interconnected and multimedia uh, world today so uh, uh this is my uh, idea of uh, folk literature uh if you ask me the how do i theorize uh, the teaching of uh, folklore in indian classrooms uh, while dealing with uh, the deep cultural ecology of uh, a nation or of a people then uh, there are a few theoretical terms and tools that uh, i would like uh, the students the researchers here to to emphasize on uh for example uh, when you talk about folklore as a canon uh you have to think about its multimediality its interdisciplinarity and its uh, social epistemology isn't it and uh, you have to historicize folklore and you have to talk about uh, the thematic concerns and pedagogy related to folklore and uh, then documentation and archiving of folklore is very very important uh, a lot of copyright issues uh, ethical and uh, legal issues are related to uh, the documentation and archiving of folklore and you have to be very careful with that uh, when uh, i talk about folklore and multimediality uh, uh, allow me to discuss the uh, ideas the discourse of orality vizavi uh, scriptocentric the phonocentric and the body centric uh, uh, formats which means scriptocentric is writing and phonocentric is orality and body centric is performative as uh, ts satyanath would say uh, the oral narratives uh, as transmedial representations and the textual and non textual orality are also important aspects vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the multimediality of uh, folklore Uh, folklore is a very very interdisciplinary subject since my topic today is the indian folklore and the reading methodologies uh, which i am trying to fit into the broader theme of the symposium on literature culture and ecology uh, allow me to talk about the interdisciplinary nature of folklore uh, folklore has historical perspectives you can connect it with uh, gender studies with anthropology with environment studies with anthropocene and uh, anthropomorphism and with uh, subaltern studies uh, with uh, visual culture uh, and with uh, study of caste and gender and and tribe and religion isn't it uh, and the theories and the pedagogy of folklore uh, uh, are very very vast but somehow uh, if you want to pinpoint uh, the the study of folklore and the cultural ecology then uh, look at the evolution and the devolution as concepts look at uh, uh, myth ritual theory and solar mythology and comparative philology and then uh, look at the uh, formation of the romantic nationalism and the formation of regional identities in folklore also the monogenesis theories are important the concepts of diffusion when face migration theory the egyptian school of folklore the historical ge geographical method of folklore the finnish school of folklore these are very interesting and important concepts and theories uh, to teach folklore in indian classrooms uh, when it comes to folk movements you have to talk about folklore and memory culture you have to talk about folklore as protest folklore and inclusivity 
folklore as redemption and healing to do so you may have to look at the uh, structural and the post structural approaches of folklore the syntagmatic structuralism the paradigmatic structuralism uh, look at vladimir prof and folklore in russia and when you talk about uh, uh, post structuralism and new hermeneutics in folklore research you can you cannot miss out uh, on talking about deconstruction and post colonialism in folklore there are different approaches to the reading of folklore like sigmund freud the psychological psychoanalytical approach c j young and then you can also talk about uh, you know the folk forms and the psychoanalysis and then you can talk about the functional approaches uh, like the symbolic functionalists the linguists and the comparative models of reading folklore uh, when you contextualize folklore in uh, indian context please do not forget to look at the semiotic approach to folk culture studies look at the material culture look at the feminist and queer approaches to folklore and look at folklore in our vernacular traditions look at folklore in the sanskrit prakrit and persian uh, approaches and then you can use storytelling as a pedagogical method for that you can read ak ramanujan's essay uh, telling tales and then uh, there is a possibility of a uh, uh, future folkloristic when you theorize folklore you you must not miss uh, looking at uh, the future possibilities of indian folk poetics because it's rather a new subject why is it a new subject you know uh, there is a school of thought uh, which uh, which believed that all oral literatures are uh, folklore and anything documented anything written loses its folk element and then it no more remains a part of our folklore i belong to a very different school of thought not just me many of you uh, the contemporary folklorists we believe in a school of thought which which uh, gives a lot of importance to the written culture of folklore as well as the oral culture i will come to that uh, but uh, currently uh, let me talk about uh, the performance centered approach of folklore because this is its narratology folklore is very visual folklore is very very performative uh, this scenario has given uh, ideas and the critical issues uh, regarding the informants and the ethnographers of folklore research and they are the co-authors and uh, the archivists of any kind of folklore research uh, but when you talk about the uh, the contextualization and its authenticity of folklore this is a very dicey subject uh, there is copyright issue or uh, there is legal and ethical issue there are legal and ethical issues related to folklore so dear students uh, i would recommend that whenever you do any kind of folklore research take care of the authenticity of uh, your material and also the copyright the patent right and other ethical view points vis-a-vis -vis your research uh, because uh, in folklore research the distinctive theoretical concepts are based on the empirical data and for empirical data your uh, your patent rights and copyrights are extremely important isn't it uh the german term volkskunde and the swedish term folkminne and the indian term lok sahitya they imply slightly different meanings uh, uh, when you compare them with the english word folklore and uh, they do not syncretize completely they are not synonymous there is a thin line between all of them uh, also uh, the classical literatures the folk literature the modern literature even there are thin lines and uh, most uh, most of the times i have noticed that researchers forget to draw this thin line between uh, the classical the folk and the contemporary literatures please do that when you do your research the vedas the great epics like the ramayana and the mahabharat the upanishad and the puranas 
the anthologies of folk tales like Hitopadesha, Brihat Katha, Katha Sarit Sagar, Betal Pachisi, and the Jataka tales, they exemplify uh, the importance of both oral and written uh, traditional creativity in India. There is no marker they see demarcation when it comes to Indian literature. I will once again come to that, uh, this idea of Marga Desi uh, demarcation or the dichotomy. But before that, uh, let me discuss the, the different phases of introduction of folklore research uh, in India. Coming to the developmental phases, uh, the initial phase in Indian folklore research was introduced by the philologists and the linguists working in Sanskrit, Persian, or Arabic languages. The second phase, however, it was uh, created by the Christian missionaries in India in India during the British period, and uh, you know they created this uh, folklore research or this archiving of folklore in order to understand the natives, uh, the Indians, in a better way uh, for effective administration on their part. And the third phase, uh, where you and me, we belong to, uh, it is the 20th and the 21st century scholars group. And we believe that uh, the oral and the written traditions in Indian folkloristic, they coexist. They borrow from one another, they exchange hands. And uh, let me quote Blackburn and A.K. Ramanujan here. Uh, they say that modern folk tales are, in most cases, as old as their parallels in the classical literature. So, folk literature uh, is deep rooted. Folklore is deep rooted in our in our Indian culture, and uh, there is this welcome fact that uh, humor studies is coming up in a big way in Indian uh, research and teaching, and this is where we use folk jokes short and simple and uh, they to, they are told within a space of few minutes and you know what it's very interesting that if you look at the folk jokes of uh, all the regions in the world you look at uh, native american literature you look at african and caribbean literature also you look at indian indigenous uh, literature and uh, australian indigenous literature you will find similar kind of folk jokes uh, which gives an indication that uh, there was some kind of uh, uh, cultural exchange uh, between the nations even uh, before the idea of documentation and archiving started. Probably the, uh, the researchers of uh, travel literature or travel studies uh, have to look into it more carefully. Uh, that uh, how uh, in the teaching of uh, in English classrooms and foreign languages classrooms, we use folk jokes, uh, and they they are so similar we can compare all of them. Having said that, uh, I would like to shift my attention now to the case study of uh, the Lakshmi Purana and Jagannath culture, and how in the in the folk literature or in the study of folklore, there is an ecological consciousness. Keeping in view the theme of the seminar, uh, Ecology and Culture, I thought uh, that talking about uh, Jagannath cult would be apt, would be more interesting here. Uh, Jagannath culture, uh, Lord Jagannath in uh, Puri temple of Odisha, the skin uh, color of Lord Jagannath is completely dark, it's completely black. And uh, uh, he stands in solidarity with the dark-skinned people. Uh, there is no, uh, he doesn't distinguish this between the, the fair and the dark. And uh, Lord Jagannath, uh, his limbs are also incomplete. Uh, his legs and uh, his hands are incomplete, which shows his solidarity with uh, the different labeled. So this is how uh, the, uh, Lord Jagannath, the very idea of uh, Jagannath, cult is a solidarity and inclusivity. Now, uh, the cooks, the people who cook in the Jagannath temple, uh, they are called the Daitapattis or uh, they are the Shabar or the tribal communities. See, uh, the food is not cooked by the, the so-called higher caste uh, Brahmins in the Jagannath temple, rather the so-called uh, lower caste uh, uh, tribal communities, the Shabar communities, the Daitapattis, they cook uh, 
uh, eco-friendly food in the Jagannath temple. Uh, this is uh, boiled food uh, and not uh, food uh, without any oil. Uh, this is boiled food which is very good for the stomach. This is very good for the human body. And the food is served uh, in eco-friendly earthen pots. They are not served in uh, steel or any other metallic pots. Rather, the food is served in the earthen pots. So, so very close to ecology and environment. The food is environment friendly. Now, uh, coming to the Lakshmi Purana uh, of uh, it's it's a 15th century uh, classical text written by Balaram Das. He is a medieval Odia poet. Uh, this text foregrounds a counter narrative to the patriarchal, the Brahminical authority, and it advocates both feminism and caste equality. Uh, it problematizes the Bharat Barsh and Faris, uh, which are India and Iran, they have been considered. Uh, the most ancient civilizations uh, in the globe. Uh, both the civilizations uh, had the trends of oral traditions and uh, when you look at their folklore, the Indian, you know, look at the folklore of both Bharat Varsha and Faris, you will find uh, a lot of similarities. Mm, the Indo-Aryans uh, belonging to the Sanskrit traditions, they wrote the Rig Veda while the Iranians wrote the Zend Avesta. Both the texts uh, have a similar ideology where uh, they talk about uh, uh, the binary oppositions between uh, the light and dark, day and night. And then uh, they talk about uh, uh, their closeness to uh, nature. And uh, they worship nature in a personified form. And uh, let me quote a few the titles of a few texts of the Sanskrit tradition and uh, the the far as the tradition of uh, uh, of the of the of the Iranians. Uh, Vedic Mitra, its counterpart can be Avistan Mitra. Vedic Varuna in Sanskrit, its counterpart uh, in Iran is Avistan Ahumazda. Then Vedic Indra, the counterpart is Avestan Varitra. Vedic Surya, counterpart is Avestan uh, Harshista. Then Vedic Agni, the counterpart is Avestan Athar. Uh, Indo Aryans, they wrote and spoke uh, Vedic Sanskrit. The Iranians wrote and spoke Avestan Persian. You find a lot of similarities similarities between uh, the both the languages and uh, they are quite interesting. Uh, something I find very interesting, uh, the, the similarity is how any kind of S sound in Vedic Sans Sanskrit is subsequently pronounced with H sound in Avestan Persian. Uh, the river Sindhu in Vedic Sanskrit was pronounced as a Hindu in Avestan Persian because S is pronounced as H in Avestan Persian. There is an important note to take here. Mm, uh, originally the term Hindu, it was meant to represent a geographical location rather than a faith or a belief system. Both the languages, you know, Vedic Sanskrit and Iranian languages, uh, their, uh, their origin is in the Indo-European language groups. Now I will uh, quote the, uh, the folk tales, some of the folk tales from the Persian traditions and you can compare them with the Jataka tales and the tales from the Panchatantra. Uh, look at the presence of animals in the tales. The wolf and the goat, uh, Susku and Musho, uh, the boy who becomes Bulbul, the wolf aunt, uh, then the praying backer, then uh, the merchant and the saffron. Uh, so, you know, there are all, so many stories where you find uh, there is an animal, there is a fish. 
uh, Iranian, Persian and Indian uh, folklore are generally divided into five major categories. Beliefs, opinions, narrations, folkloric speeches, folkloric arts and traditions. Related folklore uh, and the human as well as the animal world uh, tales uh, dominate both uh, Bharat Varsha and the forest and the stories folk tales related to both the regions. The best uh, and the most important point of commonality between all of them is uh, the study of the cultural ecology, closeness to nature, going back to nature, taking care of the planet Earth. Uh, now, look at uh, the feminist, the queer and the disability approaches of folklore. When you talk about inclusivity or flexibility, when you talk about uh, the planet Earth and accepting everyone, you cannot but get into feminism, queer uh, theory and disability research. And in the folklore and the study of folklore, you find all of them getting so much importance. There are gender approaches in folklore through the feminist lens. Gender constructs and they have their representations in our folk tales. There are fairy tales in our popular culture where you find gender discourses there. And then in the Indian context, the portrayal of women in the folk tales, myths and legends, uh, is so very important in in all our Bratta Kathai, in all our folk tales. You see that women are given maximum importance. You know they are preservers of livestock. They are the preservers and the creators. And then uh, when you look at uh, queer studies vis-a-vis -vis folklore, uh, you have to think about uh, the transgender queer, the beliefs the rituals and the performance in Indian mythology and folklore. Same-sex relationships and gender fluidity is found in ancient Indian legends and also in our temples. You go to Kunark temple, you go to any such ancient temple in India, you will find uh, that same-sex love and queer uh, engagements are very much there. And then look at Grimm's fairy tales. You will find the queer reading even there. So uh, when you approach the study of folklore through queer theory, it's very interesting because uh, here you are approaching inclusivity. You are trying to include a marginal, a subaltern group, the LGBTQ, into your study of the folklore, into your folklore research. Now, when you talk about the intersections of disability and folklore studies, you are getting into a new area of important and interesting research. You have to talk about a methodological inclusivity of the disabled in our folklore studies. You have to think about the folk beliefs and practices from a disability perspective. And then you have to examine the disability and uh, such studies in our fairy tales. There are multiple examples. I will just take a couple of examples here. Ashtavakra and Bhimabhoi. Ashtavakra, you look at this Ashtavakra Gita. The existential philosophy of life is found in a very interesting and important way in the Ashtavakra Gita. And Ashtavakra, uh, the disabled person and uh, his discourse is so important in our uh, mythical studies. And then look at Bhimabhoi, the Odia poet, the blind poet. He is the Milton of Indian literature. He is visually challenged and the kind of uh, poetry he has written, he has created the Alek Dharma. Uh, he has, you know, he has taken out, taken Alek Dharma into a new direction. If you look at his poetry and then uh, interpret his uh, folk poetry from disability perspective, you are getting into a new area of research and pedagogy. Having said that, uh, before I conclude, uh, I would like to put it uh, under curd here that my folklore research has humbled me down. I have become a people's person. I have understood 
how it is important in our english departments uh, to to go beyond uh, uh, eurocentrism and anglo americanism and get into indian knowledge system our epics our puranas our vedantas all these things should be a part of our uh, knowledge system and a part of our teaching research and pedagogy uh, keeping that in mind uh, after the introduction of ma in folk literature and also the introduction of ugc net examination in folk literature now i venture into the creation of a complete ma program in indian knowledge system that is where i expect inputs from excellent scholars like uh people sitting here out there uh, listening to me if you want to collaborate and contribute uh, research and writing to the ma program in indian knowledge system uh, and you want to collaborate with us uh, please get in touch with me your research is going to enrich uh, the program uh, we at igno uh, design and develop uh, interesting and important academic programs uh where we take best brains of the country to collaborate with us to write with us to write for us uh the nep uh, document talks about languages indigenous cultural systems cultural heritages and their preservation so the the indian knowledge system program and the folk literature program that i have been talking about they are in tandem with the nep document and the guidelines of the ugc and the national education policy uh i will stop here i invite questions uh, and comments from all of you if you have any questions uh, please let's have a discourse if you have any comments and suggestions uh, for me to improve my research you are most welcome to uh, put it here thank you very much once again uh, i thank site academy and ip university for having given me this important opportunity to talk about folklore research and the research methodologies uh, vis-a-vis uh, the preservation of culture uh, and our cultural heritages thank you